actually, since 1998, I've been working out a series of work constructed from ordinary objects, using very large quantities. I've worked with spools of thread, chenille stems, otherwise known as pipe cleaners, map tacks, those are the you are here things you stick on bulletin boards, uh, marker pen caps, more recently Swarovski crystals, uh, cut colored film on vinyl, colored faceted beads strung on monofilament, and often I incorporate some type of optical device. Here you're seeing convex mirrors, viewing spheres, and here you have binoculars in a reverse uh, you know, situation. And all of these optical devices, what they do is they shrink or condense the pixels. If you want to think of these individual units as pixels, they shrink them into their photographic origins. And a question that people often have for me is, how, how did I come up with this idea? And it, it really came from two sources. The first was in the uh, mid-90s, all the slide files in New York City started going digital. So what that meant for artists, and this is before we were sending each other JPEGs, this is before we had CD writers on our computers. I think we were getting our software on floppy disks still. But we had to take our slides to a photo lab, and they gave us the mysterious photo CD that had your images on you know, the, the digital files. And I remember the first time I opened up a file of my sculpture, at that time stone sculpture, and saw it on my computer monitor, I was completely blown away by the lack of materiality in the image that I was seeing. If there was digital nothingness there, and yet it was representing you know, something that was all about mass volume and material, that, that being stone sculpture. So that was probably the beginning of me thinking about how does a sculptor deal with digital nothingness? Um, I'm not sure, did I mention this is the first piece I did? It was constructed from about 5,700 spools of thread. And it was based on just a, a photograph that I uh, took at Lake Tahoe. And I remember thinking, ooh, there's a nice kind of shift or difference between the majestic landscape and the lowly spool of thread. And I didn't want to do anything obvious, like you know, do something with sweatshops and, and be real literal about my use of thread spools. I was more interested in using the thread spools as blocks of color. I was interested in them for their formal qualities, what they looked like as objects versus the easy connection to feminist uh, you know, activity, or, or female activity, I should say. The second piece, uh, Virtual Environment 1 from 2000, was significantly larger. It was 28 feet long. And it came as a result of a problem I was having with the first piece. And it was when it was shown in the gallery with the convex mirrors on an opposite wall. If the gallery was crowded with people, people would be asking each other, can you please step aside and try to see the image? So in the case of this large stone wall image, I was, uh, there could be 15 people standing in front of the thread, and if you look at it in the convex mirror, you would just see people standing in front of a stone wall. So it integrated what was a problem with the first piece, and it made it work in the second piece. Now, something that all of my thread school works illustrate is how subtle shifts in scale alter visual perception. And that what we think of as reality, like all of us sitting here in this room, we think of it as a static reality. It's actually a tiny scale-based band of imagery that can be perceived by the human eyes and brain. And an example of, it, of this subtle shift is if you look at the foreground, you're seeing your eyes and brain are focusing on the schools of threat, whereas in the background, you're focusing on uh, the, the stonewall imagery. And if you look carefully, both you, know, you can see both images in both situations, but you're seeing just how the brain locks onto a specific thing at a specific scale. So really, I mean, the way I've come to think of it is like there's this tiny band with the multitudes going up to the macrocosms above, the microcosms below, and yet we're only aware of this one band based on the, human, the limitations of human perception. So in 2001, I did a series of works based on cultural symbols from the 60s, and although I'm a little young to be a real hippie, my friends and I really identified with the movement. Um, we acted like hippies, we dressed like hippies, we were like anti-everything, because we didn't realize that you're supposed to be about anything. So we were superficial hippies, but I had a deep love for Volkswagen buses, and somewhere in my 30s I realized my parents can't stop me from getting one anymore. And so I do actually own a vintage Volkswagen bus, and uh, I have a great time as long as it stops. So this is uh, called VW Bus Shower Power, and it's based on the idea that the Volkswagen bus was thought of as a box on wheels. It's a life-size uh, recreation of a 1967 split-window, splitty Volkswagen bus. 
and it's constructed from 60,000 flower-shaped stickers adhered to clear vinyl shower curtains. And something you can't see with a single focus of a camera lens is that when you're standing in front of it, your eyes will shift focus from the foreground panel to the background panel, and the illusion of three-dimensionality uh, comes and goes with that shift in perception. So it creates a type of tension that as your brain's trying to make sense of which image to look at, it's kind of like when you're looking through a window, you can focus on, like, if, if the window's wet, you can look at the drops and you can't see through them, so it creates this kind of, you know, shifting back and forth. And as is the case with all the works, that when they're seen in a convex mirror through any kind of optical device, it, the pixels become more condensed, it has the illusion of being more solid. And these are three of eight bandanas that I created out of map tax. The one in the center is three-dimensional, the other two are flat with the illusion of being three-dimensional. And something interesting that um, you, you can't see again in this slide, when you walk into a gallery and you see a whole row of these bandanas, your brain instantly get, makes its best guess, which is those are three-dimensional objects. And it will hang on to that image well beyond what you would think your brain would. You can walk right up and all of a sudden, boom, half of them snap flat and you're shocked that your brain was able to hold on to that illusion. But it's a, it's a demonstration of, of really how the brain is creating an image. It's, it's projecting down an image and it hangs on to it. And that's what makes it possible for us to interact with the physical world. That something that blows my mind is that there are 10 times as many nerve fibers running from the brain down to the eyes as there are from the eyes up to the brain. So we like to think of this reality as being out there and we are observing it, but in fact, the raw data is coming in and our brain is assembling like a holographic image, projecting it back down, and that's how I'm able like, to reach out and grab this bottle. So here's a three-dimensional one, a flat one, 3D. And here you're going, yeah, I wouldn't believe that's 3D. You know, you wouldn't be fooled by the illusion, but in, in reality, you are. And the bikini series, um, they're, they're, they're based on that kind of iconic, uh, this was a popular bikini in the 70s for a while, and when I made these works in uh, 2001, Janet Jackson was like wearing one of one of her videos. It was very weird to see. She had just the top on it. Of course, it wasn't made for math tax. <laughs> this one is, it is a lady size eight in the round. You could absolutely wear it. And here's the Tom bikini. And this one, the map text is facing outward. And something I thought was interesting is it, it, it could be viewed as patriotic or subversive, depending on the perspective of the viewer, that some people thought they were patriotic, and others thought I was making a negative comment about the United States. But neither was true. I was just using this iconic image and letting people project whatever they wanted onto it. And this was a French cup bikini, actually flat look 3D, the illusion of three-dimensionality was accentuated by the fact that some of the math texts on the bottom are facing out. And this work, Kafia, it's an Arabic headdress, it's never been shown because I completed this work two months prior to 9-11. And the point of it was to show the power of cultural symbols, that this image already produced kind of a knee-jerk reaction. But what happened after 9-11 is it produced a huge knee-jerk reaction, and I felt that the work would be, uh, that I would be viewed as making some hostile statements, which was not my intent. So this work has actually never been shown, although it's in, there was a PBS um, piece uh, that's going to be aired on a, sun, a Sunday morning show in the coming months, I don't, a month, I don't know when they're going to do it, but they spent a lot of time photographing it, so it'll be interesting if they included the piece to see what people think of it. If it's enough time since 9-11 that people can then see it again as a cultural symbol versus some hostile statement about um, the Arabs. And this piece, Lila the Rug, I remember uh, I contacted the uh, electric set company and asked them if they'd give me 18,000 pen, pens. And they said, no, we'll give you the caps. So I said, okay, I'll take the caps. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to take the pens and stick them in a standard uh, you know, the thing you see in the, in the graphic design stores and just have them look like a, just a rack of pens and then I would just have the labels in such an order that you'd see this image just randomly stuck in this, um, this uh, rack. But of course, those are too expensive, they gave me the caps. And I really struggled for a long time of what to do with the caps because one of my criteria is that I don't want to alter materials, I want to keep them as close to their intended purpose as possible. And everything I was trying with these very mechanical objects looked um, stiff. 
So I had, it, uh, all my ideas were about a wall piece and they were some kind of image. And they lacked the kind of humanity or they lacked an organic quality. And after struggling, 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 I remember spinning around in my chair and looking down on the floor at this rug that's been in my family since the 40s. And I immediately thought, perfect. If I made these into a rug, it's more organic, it's sculptural versus like, you know, a snapshot. And uh, then I did some research and I found out that this rug that's been in my family isn't even a Persian rug. It's uh, the first mass-produced rug that's been in continuous production uh, from the Kerasan Company, by the Kerasan Company, since the 1920s. So I thought, oh my gosh, there's layers of deception like crazy. And that's why I titled it Lie Like a Rug. <laughs> And that's a detail of the market pen caps. So the Kerasan Company came and saw this uh, piece when it was first shown at Hira in Soho. And they made a comment. They said, it looks like I designed this piece the same way they make their rug prototypes. And what they do is they create a quarter of a rug. And they put it in a corner and they put mirrors up into that corner on the walls so that when you step back, you see the whole rug. They don't have to make a whole rug for each prototype. So literally just for kicks, and that's not the way I did it, but I just went home and just grabbed images that I had been you know, looking at on my computer, and I, I digitally created that same illusion by taking a quarter, you know, dividing it into four quarters and mirroring and flipping to end up with these new images. And it was done just for my entertainment value. So then, shortly after that, it's weird how one thing leads to another, but um, I was invited by the Montclair Art Museum to do a site-specific uh, work of art in this stairwell installation space. And when Patterson Sims, who's the director of the museum, took me on a tour, I remember leaving with two strong impressions. One was um, this Hopper painting, which is the most valuable piece in their collection. That's my interpretation, upper right. And the other was this large collection of Native American <coughs> objects. So I, I, I thought, well, those are really different kinds of things, but I, I just you know, thought if there's any way to tie those together, that'd be interesting. But then I went home and just continuing on with my playing, I took that hopper image and divided it into four separate quadrant uh, views. And what I ended up with was were two <coughs> that looked a lot like Native American textiles. And then two that looked like surrealist, you know, Western art, not, you know, cowboy art, but Western versus Eastern art. And so I thought, well, that's an interesting way to tie together these two uh, different collections. And then the background was created by taking each one of those quarter flipped and rotated images, turning it 90 degrees, and then stacking it to create this wallpaper. <coughs> so how I got involved in the biology of seeing, in, in neurology really, is by an offhand comment by a friend of mine who's a neurologist who deals with brain injury. He's a leading neurologist. He's often the second opinion that people you know, send reports to if they're patients with brain injury. And he was looking at the series of work that I had done based on Chuck Close. And you can see it there on the left that there's, it's cropped and changing of incremental scale and shifting. You can see it's the same image but different aspects of it. And after like walking around the studio a few times, it finally clicked for him of what, what he was looking at. And he said, oh, this is neurologic priming. And of course, I'm like, well, how do you spell that? And you know, so I, I, I researched it, and I thought, well, that's so interesting that he was basically saying this is the way the human brain learns, learns to make sense of things it hasn't been exposed to. And from his point of view, it, like if somebody has a brain injury, they have to, be, they have to learn all over again. They have, their brain has to be primed once again. So I thought, well, well gosh, let's go with that. And so I did a, a series um, based on Jackson Pollock, a, uh, a life-size recreation of a uh, drip painting. And again, like the, the uh, Chuck Close piece, I, through incremental cropping and changing scales, I created like an opportunity for neurological priming for viewers. And something off, you know, a little bit different about this piece that I find interesting, just on the idea of color theory, is this work is a perfect example of how you mix red and green and blue and yellow, or purple and yellow and all the opposite colors and you end up with these muddy earth tones because this piece has amazing bright colors in it and when you see it on the floor, it goes all earth tones. So the limitations of the eye are blending those colors into uh, like blend paint on the palette. 
So here we have the whole series. And <coughs> something, like, like I've said before, I tend to like, <coughs> be uh, compelled about an image. Like Jackson Pollock, the first time I stood in front of a drip painting, before I knew anything about art, I felt profoundly moved by it. And I just thought, what is that? That there was some truth about it. Has anybody had that experience before you knew about art standing in front of a Pollock painting? That you just, you're, you're, I felt like it was very, very, um, you know, moved in a very deep, like a basic way, not intellectual, but I just felt like I was seeing something um, deep and meaningful. And what I think it was that I was experiencing is the fractals in the pieces, that a scientist uh, basically pulled apart all the different layers of Pollock painting and assessed in each successive drip painting, the ratio of fractals became higher and higher. So Pollock was able to recognize the fractal patterns that really make up the, the you know, the natural world, and fractals are like, a simple way of thinking of them is a tree top and a broccoli top, you know, they're similar at different scales, so there's all these different repeating patterns that make up the natural world. And I think, when he was like in his drunken stupors with his head like, you know, on the ground, he was surrounded by fractals and intuitively, he was able to recreate these in his paintings. So that became like a reason to do this other than I like drift paintings. And often I do, the, the, the research helps me you know, really confirm in my mind that this is worth doing even if nobody else in the world ever likes it, ever wants to see it, ever wants to show it, ever review or can it. It's a way for me to say, you know, I made this decision based on this reason versus I did it because I liked it. And that just doesn't sit well enough with me to then justify creating very large works that take a long time that I'm going to then have and be dragging around with me my whole life like this. So I don't know if any of you have collected enough art that you feel like you're starting to get careful about what you make, but um, I have a lot of big art, so I do try to make as few does as possible. So, okay, so here we have uh, the life size, 8 by 16. And you'll notice with, with each reduction scale, the resolution is being reduced. So you're getting a more, if you want to think of it, the abstraction of an abstract expressionist work. But you can still say, you know, I see autumn rhythm there in the 4 by 8 the two by four, and if you squint, you can see even more. One by two, six by one, three by six, two by three, one by two. <laughs> so really, I mean, it does raise the question, at what point is the image no longer odd rhythm? I mean, in my brain, those two pipe cleaners in the wall, when seen in the entirety, I think kind of still are odd rhythm. Um, but it, again, it's that neurological problem. You're making, you're finding an image because you know what you're looking for. So this, of course, led to me thinking about, you know, the other links between art and science. And, and if you really look through the history of art, artists have often intuitively come up with something that science uh, then verifies years later. That there is, a, that I think, you know, art and science are very, very related. Right now, in the technological world we live in, they seem very different. But um, I, do, I do see a, a, quite the, the connection. So, and what I was really trying to say with these is that the fact that I'm using uh, digital technology, which is the technology of our era, and using mass-produced objects, which are also a technology of our era, and using, you know, some of the, uh, what we're learning about the brain, you know, through these you know, functional MRI scanners, that that is not anything new. That artists have always used technology. The technologies might have been like a new pigment shows up. That's the technology, really. And then all of a sudden, painting changes. I mean, the big one was when optics arrived. If you've all read David Hockney's book, it's a fascinating. And you don't even have to read it; just look at the pictures. And all of a sudden, optics arrive, painting changes. So it's it's basically just putting it in the context of this is not anything new that I'm doing. It, I'm just one more artist living in an era. Um, so this, of course, is based on Vermeer's music lesson, and it is widely thought that Vermeer used the camera obscura to construct the compositions. And a lot of people are upset by the fact that David Hockney said this because as though it was taking something away from Vermeer. And really, <coughs> if any artist can learn to draw two-point perspective in Vermeer, I'm sure it was an excellent draftsman, but he was able to kind of jump ahead and do that part really quickly, do a quick sketch inside a camera obscure, and then move on to what made Vermeer Vermeer, which is, of course, the use of light and his choice of to put things in the composition. But something, if, you, if you're not a, a non-believer about Vermeer using a camera obscura,
take some of his portraits and negative spherize them in Photoshop a little bit by like 7%, 7 points, and see how much more realistic they look. That a lot of them have a slight distortion that uh, I think has something to do with the lens that he was using. Uh, Hans Holbein, of course, his use of anamorphic perspective is, is, uh, is what made this painting famous. And anamorphic, anamorphic perspective is a mathematical technology that is attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. And I was talking to somebody earlier, they were asking, how did I make this? That Photoshop allows you to do this anamorphic, you know, the swirling, the uh, creation of this type of anamorphic perspective in, in an instant. But you can actually do this mathematically. You can Google it online, and it's like a lesson for like a 12th grade class or 10th grade class. It is, it, you can definitely do this without the technology. But again, what I'm doing is overlaying the, the abilities that we have today on top of his technology that was available to him in that era. In that era. And here I've taken just the elongated skull, and the top view you're seeing is the straight on view. Uh, the lower right is from an extreme angle, like standing next to the piece, and then you're just seeing a detailed view. And the last work from this particular sub-series was uh, based on a Salvador Dali painting, which was based on one of the earliest pixelated images, and it was made by a Bell Lab scientist in 1973. Um, and it was intended to show the mineral conditions needed to recognize the human face. So you're seeing the black and white image, that being the image made by the Bell Lab scientists. The one on the right is my interpretation of Dolly's, one of two variations he did on that uh, particular painting. And then the one in the center is the merging of the two. And here, like the Chuck Close and the Jackson Pollock, you're seeing through that shifting scale and cropping how you can make sense of all of these as you see them you know, within the context of the whole. So your brain instantly is like looking back and forth, what is the relationship, and then boom, 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 you make sense of something. And here's an example of um, neurological priming in action if, you, if you're curious. And you, you might have to squint because you're pretty close to a large image. But if you look at the female figure on the right and really you know, get, like, stare at a particular point, like maybe the back of her head, and, but you know, get the whole figure really stuck in your brain and quickly shift to the pixelated version and squint and see if you can't see just the slightest remnant of that woman. So that's a neurological prime. Your brain is projecting what it's looking for there. And one other small example is if you go back to the image on the right, you look down at her calf, you see that little image of Abraham Lincoln? Okay, now, once, now try to not see it. So once it's there, it's there, which is a problem for me in my work is because I always know what I'm making before I've made it, so I never actually experience my work for the first time. So I have to, with Threadsful Works and the viewing spheres, I actually have to base the success on the piece by watching other people experience them because I really don't know what the experience is. It's kind of a shame. I, maybe someday I'll get hit in the head really hard and I'll have to relearn and I'll be able to experience the work. Um, so a lot of the works that are uh, opening tomorrow at the museum uh, were based on a, an installation I did for the Ljubljana Print Biennale, which is like a really big show, an international show. And they had a like a hundred year anniversary and they invited institutions from each country to, to curate their own booths. So the Brooklyn Museum was the American institution and Marilyn Kushner, who was the print curator there at the time, invited me to do this installation. Now, it was a print biennale, and I'm not a printmaker, so it was an interesting choice for her to invite me. But what I ended up focusing on is, is really you know, the effects of mechanical reproduction on how image, images exist in our mind's eye. And a lot has been written about that, but one of the things that is obviously lost is the idea of scale. So the Mona Lisa is the, the best example I can think of of something that exists in our mind's eye at one scale, but in reality is of a different scale. It's just 30 inches high by 21 inches wide. So this is the first very small thread school piece I did, and I did it to scale, so it dictated how many schools I'd be using, which is very few. And if you look at just the schools, on the right you see that there's very little uh, you know, data there. And yet, when you look in the viewing sphere, you are seeing the Mona Lisa. So again, your brain is filling in what it knows about the Mona Lisa and projecting it into that sphere. 
And just to give you an idea of just how low res this is, if you think about what 17 pixels across by 25 high looks like on your monitor, at 100%, it's like a postage stamp. And yet, that is enough to do the Mona Lisa. This is not enough if I were to do a self-portrait. You, would, you wouldn't recognize it because you don't know me like you know the Mona Lisa. Uh, this one, again, researching the Mona Lisa, I stumbled upon an interesting um, a study by Margaret Livingstone, who was a neurophysiologist at Harvard. And she studied, and she was interested in why that smile is so elusive. And what turned out to be the case is that it's rather blurry, and it's, so it's best seen with these, what are called low spatial frequencies of peripheral vision, which means if you're not looking at the smile, you can actually see it on her face, and yet when you look at the mouth, it disappears. So what I did is I actually used the viewing sphere to really exaggerate that smile. The curve of the viewing sphere creates a smile that you can see with central versus peripheral vision. And this piece brings up a point that all of the scientific foundation that helps me make this piece and not another piece, it, it, it's only a jumping off point that for me, the piece should stand on its own if you knew none of my motivations, that you might just smile back in Mona Lisa because it looks kind of funny and it is humorous and humor is something I, I'm interested in as a human emotion. Um, I think it's sometimes underrated that we should be you know, moved in a, you know, in a deep, meaningful, whatever way, but humor, I think, is a very, very powerful emotion. So, so you, you can know all the stuff I'm saying, or you can know none of it, and I would hope that the work stands on its own without having to know any of it. And the last supper, another example of um, how things exist in a certain size in our mind's eye. Like, for me, before I knew how large it really was, the Last Supper was about that wide by about that tall, and I think it's probably based on posters I've seen. <coughs> so, of course, when I found out that it is 29 feet wide and 15 feet high, I've cropped it top and bottom, it's not practical to have such a tall piece. I thought, well, that's something interesting I didn't know about the piece. And I thought other people would find it interesting as well. So there's one other aspect of the piece that, that I'm sure was very important to Da Vinci, but it's not widely known because it's not included in the posters. That is the relationship of the mural to the site. And you can see how there's this illusion of the extension of three-dimensional space into the mural. Um, that was probably really complicated to, to do, and I'm sure it was important to him. So I brought that aspect back in by creating this kind of trapezoidal-like form, showing it with a, an open-ended trapezoid, but showing it with um, a viewing sphere so that as you walk around, you're seeing it as a three-dimensional space. And another thing about this piece that I thought was interesting is when I found out that Da Vinci wrote that to best appreciate three-dimensionality in paintings, it's best to close one eye and stand far away from the painting. And the viewing sphere actually creates this experience by focusing both of your eyes on a single point in the sphere and by shrinking it as though it's being seen from a great distance. So it made me think that perhaps one of the reasons these images are so shocking when you see them in the sphere is there's something else at play that Da Vinci already recognized about creating the illusion of three-dimensionality. So then the one other thing I learned, and this led to a whole series, is that the Christ figure's right eye is the center, uh, single vanishing point for every architectural element within the mural and also it extends out into the architectural space. And that's pretty amazing. It's not like the center of the Christ figure, right? It's, it's the right eye. And so, of course, that led me to, to a whole series I did on eye-centeredness in three-quarter view portraits. And based on what one scientist, um, Christopher Tyler at USC, did a study. He basically looked at 2,000 three-quarter view portraits over the last 2,000 years and assessed that way too many artists were centering one eye left to right than would be expected since he couldn't find any reference to it in any art history books and any art instruction books. So he, of course, threw a bunch of students in functional MRI scanning machines to see is symmetry, the ability to recognize symmetry, some kind of hard thing. <coughs> and he assessed, yes, it was. Um, and it does make sense that, yes, it is, that if you're like a primate or even a human being, if we're primates, but running around in the forest, it's really in your best interest to be able to spot symmetry in that two eyes looking at you would look a little different than leaves. So I think, I think just like the fractals, you know, we've evolved as mammals looking at fractals. So of course our brains are, are hardwired to recognize fractals like Pollock did, but also that symmetry would make sense that we can identify that. 
And a little side note on symmetry is like the most beautiful quote unquote people have highly symmetrical faces that it shows like, you know, probably some deep, like good genetic uh, material that you'd want to reproduce with. Of course, I have a very asymmetrical face, but let's forget about that. Um, so basically what I did is I took a, a, a range of uh, artists and portraits to show just how widespread this was. Here's Van Eyck from, uh, this was from 1433, Man with the Red Turban. And I did try to pick paintings that were recognizable to people. And I also picked uh, paintings that would break apart into really beautiful colors. That how these works look in their abstraction, if you've never looked at the viewing sphere, that they hold their own in their abstraction is important to me. Um, so there's a girl with a pearl earring. Portrait of Gertrude Stein by Picasso from 1906. Here's a back out of the center, but a lot of Picasso's have very uh, centered, with weird, complex symmetries in Picasso. Someday I have to like really hook her down and do something with that. <clears throat> uh, Mona Lisa is a perfect example of eye centeredness. Here I'm just kind of messing around by dividing it along the vertical axis and mirroring each side. But of course, this messing around often ends up in the production of a piece. And this is a print edition that was commissioned by Calcografia Nacional in Spain, where um, I took a painting in their collection, a Goya painting from 1815, which kind of blows me away because I, this feels to me like it could have made, been made yesterday. It feels so contemporary. But here's how I created those, that image. So divide along the vertical axis, and here I'm just separating them. And here you're seeing both the old image and the new image. I see how your eyes can flick back and forth. But once I bring it into 100% uh, both sides, how, you, how you're, you can hide something in plain sight by forcing the brain to focus on symmetry. So in, in some weird way, these to me represent Goya's parents. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the original uh, portrait of Gertrude Stein by Picasso. And there is a life-size um, recreation done in Swarovski crystals. I had a detailed view at the very beginning of the presentation. But what I thought was interesting is the image on the right, how you get that weird kind of skull shape and those weird hands. It just, it's just a reason for me to do something I think might be interesting to look at. And I also did Man with a Red Turban life-size. And it's a eight, uh, 7 by 10 inches. That significant painting that looms much larger in my mind is tiny. And here it is uh, divided and mirrored. So it became like a rose shape on one side. And I just thought they were, they were beautiful images and less literal than a lot of my other work. So just to, to really kind of go in, in different directions uh, with this idea. And here are some just quick examples of different artists who are eye centering a lot. Uh, Frida Kahlo did it quite often. There's uh, Vermeer. Renoir did it with these full on. Uh, figures that why would one eye just have to be centered if it wasn't, you know, trying to. Rembrandt did it. Another Da Vinci, and I just love the way this flabby belly thing happened. <laughs> <laughs> that I had to do it in crystal. And uh, again, um, uh, Da Vinci did it like all the time. I'm sure he did it consciously. Nothing sub subconscious about Da Vinci. And so that helped me make a decision to do that self-portrait in, in threat. And Van Gogh uh, also encouraged me to do that self-portrait and thread. It ties it in conceptually to other works. Why do this one versus another one? It just helps me make decisions. Uh, another Da Vinci, Cezanne, and de Kooning. I just thought that looked so wild. And I, these are just a selection. I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of these. Uh, Medigliani, another Kahlo. I just think they interesting look at Picasso, like I said, he has a lot of very complicated symmetry going on in his work. And a lot of the figurative works end up going male on one side, female on another. Kind of weird. So the next series I did was based on Star Trek. And you wonder, how do you get from art historical reference to Star Trek? Well, it took years to figure this one out. Because the reality is I really like Star Trek. And I became obsessed with it after 9-11. This is before we had digital recording, so I had to actually be home from 3 to 5 to watch back-to-back -back episodes on Spike TV. But I, I remember, like, you know, I finally figured out what the obsession at that time was. And that was that, that if, for those of you who, who like the next generation, there's this, like, everybody's getting along, and, you know, there's only one, you know, big 
like species out there, and that's the four. But everybody else, like it, it's misunderstandings that are causing conflict. It's not the old Star Trek where you know good and evil, like the you know, American being Kirk and all that. So I really, I did, I think what it did is it offered me like a break from what what it's like to live in uh, New York City post 9/11. That the idea that different species could get along. But of course, here in Spock, I had to make his eye center, so I did. And the reason, though, that I finally justified doing the whole series is when I looked at um, each Star Trek series had at least one episode based on the notion of a mirror or parallel universe, which then tied right back into the art historical, you know, what I'm, what I'm really doing with my other work, which is presenting this subjective or overlapping reality. So this was my loose tie-in to help me justify doing this piece. And this is slightly larger than life uh, transporter that really is only pie-shaped, and I have mirrors, like the Karistan rug idea that gives you the illusion of the full transporter set, and also gives the illusion of almost like six guys beaming in when in fact there are only two beaded figures there. Um, another justification is that people recognize these characters, that if you don't recognize these images, then it's not that interesting to see them. And I have to say, going back to the, the, the use of beads, to, and they move, and they glisten, and they sparkle, there's little silver beads between each color bead, that I believe that is my best use of materials to convey an idea ever, and I'm not sure I'll ever beat it, to convey beaming in. And even people who don't like Star Trek, like, you know, they, they have, like, good positive vibes about this piece because they're really funny. They're beaming and you know they're beaming and you know who they are and everything. And it, and it just has much more universal appeal than I anticipated that the show had so much uh, worldwide exposure. It was craziness, like articles in, in <coughs> Australia and, and, you know, Boeing, Boeing, that thing, I guess is a really big deal that I got Boeing twice. and. Uh, so it was really, it was kind of, it was great to reach well beyond the art world because really the gallery was packed with people who normally don't go to galleries. And that is a great accomplishment for a New York gallery. Uh, here you have the Enterprise. Um, and for those of you who know Star Trek, the, the blue um, rim around the edge is actually the four viewing windows. So what you're seeing is the Enterprise going by the front of the Enterprise, all based on this one episode, Mirror, Mirror, which for those of you who know this, that it was, it was when some, transporter mishap happened because there was an electrical storm and Kirk and Spock and McCoy, no, but some of the characters ended up in a savage <coughs> parallel universe and they had to figure out how to get back. So that, of course, felt very real. <coughs> I was in a savage parallel universe myself and uh, New York and um, so I had to, you know, tie in that series. So here you have two of the characters from that series, Uhuru and Sulu. Spock and Kirk wearing those weird, this is the evil Spock. And the mind melt, you gotta do a mind melt. So again, time, you know, it seems like one thing leads to another and then back around and spins back and I, I, different ideas become useful again. Uh, only half of this forward, this bridge is visible, uh, is actually created in threat. There's an adjacent wall with mirrors that creates the illusion of the whole bridge, and again, it's playing with symmetry. And this one I won't even begin to explain, but it is a holodeck doorway as seen from inside the holodeck. And I, I had to do this for me and the five people who would get it, because those people would be blown away. Uh, but basically, the holodeck was a virtual environment where it would be as real as this room, and you could walk out and you'd still be in the holodeck. And, um, and the last thing that disappears before your virtual reality really begins is this doorway. But what surprised me is this piece ended up selling uh, to Microsoft. So it's in their uh, welcoming center. So I guess people at Microsoft know that the holodeck is a cool thing. Because really, if you, <laughs> if you put this thing anywhere, really what it's saying is the environment around it is a holodeck. So in a sense, it's creating a real holodeck. Because this is really a holodeck. We're creating it with our brains so we can interact with it. What could be more holodeck like? But again, I, like I said, me and five people. Um, and there is just the illusion of three-dimensional space. And these are three characters that I did, did in a partially beamed in, um, you know, you can see a lot of that like in the center. The Microsoft put these right in the front of their lobby that when you walk into the um, welcoming center, that's what you see, three guys beaming in. 
And since then, I've done some other uh, cultural icons. This is what I call the Super Maryland um, because I'm exaggerating. I, I thread spool piece itself is already made round, you know, con convex, and that's exaggerated again by the sphere. So you're getting like Super Maryland now. And a Warhol suit can recognizable. One of the things that is interesting in person in this piece is that you can see how vague the word Campbell's is when you look at the thread and yet how in the sphere you feel you can see it but it's not there. You're just projecting the, something you know. <coughs> and uh, American Gothic, this is an interesting piece because it demonstrates how you have to know the image to uh, be able to see it. That if, whenever I've shown this, one person was going, oh my god, it's a farmer in the white. And all the, the next person was going, I don't see anything. What is that? What do you see? They can't see it because they don't know it. So in some ways, this piece can be more profound than the Mona Lisa because everybody knows the Mona Lisa. And I'm going to quickly buzz through. These were works that I did um, for a show. Wink to the Louvre is the name of the show in Paris this last summer. And I picked works that are in their museum so that they would recognize them. And there was a distinct difference in the people who were visiting my studio and the people who went to see the show there of what they could and couldn't see. A Monet that's in their, uh, uh, one of their museums. Cezanne, another Cezanne. Picasso. Van Gogh is there. <coughs> and I often go back into my ideas files. I've been wanting to do this piece for years, but I couldn't justify doing it. But this is in, in their museum. And I just, I love, I just love the colors of the piece and the architectural, you know, all the lines. So I got to do it. And within this gallery, they had one room that we call the Mona Lisa room. So you went through my whole show, you went in the bathroom, and you only saw the Mona Lisas, which is kind of a direct like reference to how you experience the Mona Lisa at the Louvre, that you go through the whole museum and finally get to the Mona Lisa room. So we had a, there was a life-size Mona Lisa and an anamorphic Mona Lisa. So what you're seeing is the correction on the right in the sphere. Uh, again, I did it on the computer, but you could do all this uh, mechanically, mathematically. And this piece that was shown at the Museum of Arts and Design, the inaugural show there, was seen by 60,000 people. <coughs> Not everybody could see it in the United States because they didn't understand it because they hadn't experienced it. That if you've been to see the Mona Lisa in the last 10 years, your experience of seeing the Mona Lisa is like you've got 10,000 people with their digital cameras up in the air just like that. And people who knew that laughed, and this was intended to be a funny piece, but everybody in Paris walked in and they thought that was hilarious. So bring in an experiential component loss in mechanical reproduction, which is, of course, the crowds. And again, I'll be moving quickly through just some large public works. Um, reflections was done for uh, the Centro Medico train station in Puerto Rico. And I ended up going with a very soothing subject matter. It's the medical school. It's the hospital. And I wanted to pick an imagery that the general public would be familiar with. They're on an island, so I thought this would be good. Um, but I remember when I was looking at different uh, ideas for the site, I started off being very smart about it. I thought, oh, they have medicinal plants there, and I'm going to do a whole thing that's going to be so smart. But none of them look good as I created, like, you know, I'm able to put them, you know, in digital environments and look at it. And I kept wanting to make everything mirrored left to right. And this is before I did any of that symmetry research. That, and I just went with that and ended up with a symmetrical image, so it's mirrored. Um, and about two weeks after I committed to doing this idea, I realized that it was a perfectly symmetrical building and my piece was placed in the center of it so that I was responding subconsciously to symmetry before I knew anything about it. Another piece, a large piece, that was 60 feet wide, 60,000 schools, this is 54 feet wide. I walked into this lobby and instantly thought of Renee's water lilies at MoMA, um, announced it to the art consultant who was, you know, uh, commissioning this piece, and it turns out her favorite piece in the world is that piece, so of course I got the commission not to that. And here I showed them with hemispherical, like half dome mirrors, because people weren't going here to see art, and I wanted to be, make it very easy to see that these mirrors were related to the piece across the lobby. And you could also touch up your lipstick or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> so there you are in the center one. They were quite large. That was, was probably maybe three feet in diameter, maybe four feet. And here, just seeing how uh, related to the environment it is, it's something that's important to me. I don't want to just slap something on there. I, I actually consider it easier to work with 
uh, an architectural space and to come up with an idea from nothing. That you can respond to something and start with some idea. And it also, you end up doing things you never would have uh, thought of without responding to the idea first. And that's just the snapshot of the original MoMA. Uh, the works at One Penn Plaza were commissioned by NIFA for a long-term loan for this uh, lobby that is at, on the same block as the original old uh, Penn State. <coughs> so all these are related to the subway. And this is anamorphic, you know, in that I've elongated and made it like a trapezoidal shape, but I've hidden that back by making it oval. I've cut off the weird edges. Um, so as you're walking by, you're just seeing this beautiful, you know, pastel-y, muddy colors. And you can see here how it's corrected in a mirror on an adjacent wall, so that what was oval when you walked by it is now corrected and circular. And there were two um, elevator bays. I had a threads full work at one end and a mirror at the other end, so that no matter which side you were walking <coughs> in, you actually got to experience an aspect of the art. Uh, this was a, the original clock at Old Penn Station. When you looked directly at it, you had a sense that it was a clock, but it had really, I thought, a beautiful graphic element to it. And then looking down the other side, you actually could read that it said Eastern Standard Time, because I had it flipped in the original thread. And the most obscure of all, it was a, a view of the main concourse at the old Penn Station. Um, almost didn't do this piece, probably shouldn't have done this piece, but they needed another piece, and um, so I did this piece. <laughs> and I'll probably own this piece and drag it around for the rest of my life once it comes up on uh, uh, this long-term loan. And Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, they are an interesting company. They put $3 million worth of art on every new ship. And <coughs> And they do two very large commissions, one for the, I don't know what the term is, the front and one for the back is separate terms, where the big out, where all the glass enclosed elevators go by so that people can go for their next feeding frenzy. And so really what I wanted to do was as people were zipping by, I wanted to give them enough that they would be curious to see more. Um, so I picked something that had some elements that you could see easily. You'd see that it was a wine glass, but you certainly wouldn't guess that there was a bed and a comb there zipping by. You were way too close. Um, and on each deck, there were four decks that had monoculars flipped, so they could actually only see the image uh, if they investigated beyond the glass elevator to the, to the dining room. So that's really probably the most that they would see up front. And the process, it, it, it what's I think most unique about my process now compared to when I was a stone carver and you make it up as you go along, is it's highly compartmentalized. So there's this beginning stage where all I'm doing is at the computer. And I spend way too much time at the computer. I, I call it staring at my computer. I'm actually working, but it feels like I'm staring at my computer. For those of you who spend a lot of time in front of me, you probably feel the same way. That, that's where I do my research, that's where I do my digital, you know, my renderings, everything is at the computer. The one advantage is I don't create any volume of materials that I get to just close the computer at the end of the day, um, but it does not give you much of a sense of satisfaction because you have nothing to show for it often. So this is the part of the process that probably takes the most patience. Everybody thinks assembling work is the part that takes patience. That's actually the relief, that I'm done making decisions, and, you know, I'm tormenting myself about each decision, like exactly how many schools high is going to be, how wide should it be. I manipulate the colors quite a bit so that they're beautiful in their abstraction. So, you know, I'm trying to decide is that the right mix of colors or should I add more blue, should I take out more blue, and all that. And, um, you know, I feel like they're all important decisions and I've not found a way to do it without feeling like I'm tormenting myself. So, to date, I still torment myself during this phase. Um, and one of the advantages, though, of working digitally is I can basically create these digital renderings that are pretty close to the final thing. And I can get very specific, and in the case of public commissions, you need to get specific. You need to tell them within like a smidgey of a smidgey that every bolt is going right there before the engineers will approve that you install the piece. So you have to tell them with each mirror, you know, where the bolts are going to go and all of that. So, so I think it helps, and to date, you know, everybody that's gotten the commission was happy because they knew exactly what they were getting. So there was the final digital rendering, and there was the final piece, pretty close. Um, to make assembly wonderful, I designed, carefully designed all my assembly stations so that you're not stooping over, that you can almost like fall into a trance where you're you know, reaching out for a school and you end up becoming really skilled.
skilled at very weird things, but the brain loves to be skilled and it doesn't care if you're doing a tennis stroke or you know, like able to do a brush stroke just how you want or able to get four schools to roll out of your, you know, of, of a box into your hand onto a map like a, like a Pez container, one of those Pez things. That it, it's highly rewarding. I think it's like flooding your brain with chemicals all the time because it's addictive. And any person that's ever helped me with one of these, we all say, okay, we're going to work, we're going to do four maps. So we do four maps and then somebody goes, let's just do one more. Okay, one more, but that's it. And you end up doing one more, it's like, okay, we're going to stop. And it, I, don't, I think, I mean, there's something really happening in the brain that makes you happy. That I think it's the repetition, it's the, that you get skilled at, you get so fast at scanning all these numbers that in reaching up and remembering that you have to put this one there, that, that it's, it's deeply satisfying for some weird reason. But then again, if you look at religion, there's these repetitive qualities to, to most religions with the repetition of prayers, with the counting of things, that I think it, it, that they've keyed into these religions. Um, something that's very, you know, true about human nature is that repetition and this, you know, all of that is, is soothing uh, in some way. So here I am rushing through, even though it was timeless, I felt like I was rushing through a Discovery Channel piece. I had to do it so fast, but I, I didn't. And that's what schools look like on a map. It's like a giant game of bingo. <laughs> My old studio, um, this, that was the first studio I had that I was able to look at works and leave them up and make more works versus make a piece, have to pack it before I could make another piece. So it was a, it was a luxury to be able to uh, you know, even look at a piece for more than three days. Uh, my new studio, there you're seeing the barely beamed in guys. These guys were um, in front of a window, and they look best in front of a window, but they still know who they are, and they're not, there's nothing to them there. They're almost transparent, and that's Jake the dog. Different views of the studio works in progress. Um, and just, you know, you're just seeing the, the scale of everything. Um, this is before I had a studio. I, everything I owned was on wheels. I would put it in a storage unit. I'd get big commission. I'd rent a space rent a truck, move everything, and set the whole thing up, and then turn the whole thing down and bring it back to the storage unit. It was not easy to do. And here they're transferring the spools from a temporary tubing to stainless steel tubing for Puerto Rico. Boxes, I mean, everything about when you do something that with materials that are they're not intended to be used in that way for it, you have to create everything. Like, how are you gonna uh, pack 60,000 spools of thread? you know, 500 plus columns in a way that is easy to unpack at the other end because I'm going to be overseeing installation. So, you know, it, it really forced me to, to think well beyond what I'd ever thought of before. And with the Puerto Rico Commission, it was a huge budget. It was over $300,000 and you have to spend 80% of it to get the 60, the 20% the artist, that is the artist fee part. And so I was like trying to think, well, how do you spend so much money? And what was interesting is the difference between me trying to spend a ton of money and <coughs> trying to really penny pinch was so minuscule that it changed how I think of doing things. That it, in fact, there aren't that different. Uh, there's a lot of beginning and endings, which I think is deeply satisfying. This is the last column being packed. That's Taza being very happy. Um, on the right, you're seeing the big crates that sometimes feel like my coffins when they come back. I feel like they're weighing me down when they're in the studio. Um, and off to Puerto Rico it goes. So we started one morning. Uh, I get, you know, they asked me, what do we need to install this piece? So I have to tell them, you need two scissor lists, we need five people, and, and I have to devise a, a mechanism to do things, which is kind of fun, it's interesting. Um, and no, nothing got damaged, nobody got hurt, and by the end of the day, it's dark, but we were able to get the whole piece up. And up to the mirrors. But it gives you a sense of scale and, and you know, the engineering of the whole thing. And what I'm doing now is a small commission for Hotel Lobby. Mondrian was uh, inspired by the colors in the lobby as well as you'll see those mirrors on the right, these unusually shaped mirrors. Um, that I thought it just it, it plays with the vitality of the city. It's called Fashion 26, so there's a theme of uh, textile in the, in the whole hotel, so the use of thread spools ties it in, I think, very nicely. Uh, did a small chino stem piece based on uh, Hendrix, part of another uh, subject matter I've been wanting to pursue for years that I finally have the time to do, that iconic rock stars that, you know, pull at our hearts in some way uh, that I can't explain. 
Uh, this is just a digital rendering of a piece that I'm doing that's going to be debuting at Pulse, one of the um, art fairs in Miami in December. I'm um, trying to get my thread in before I get back and see. And a fun piece uh, that I think will be popular. Like they say at art fairs, make it big. If you can't make it big, make it red. Well, it's not that I was inspired to make it red. It just happens to be red, so it will probably do well. And this is optional. We can end here, or you can find out something that's crazy about me. <laughs> yes or no? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. This is a hint. I am a complete <coughs> lunatic about people. <laughs> and I, 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 everybody I know who's a lunatic about this is as crazy as I am. There's a lot of artists who do this, too, that, that it, it, it feeds into something that the creative mind loves. But basically, you teach your dogs, it's all about training through positive reinforcement. You teach your dogs to go through an obstacle course in a specific uh, order. And so you're running around like a lunatic at the same time, which is the part I think that's really, really fun. So this is Jake being very serious about his job. There he is on the top of the dog walk, out of a tunnel, over the A-frame that's like way up here. We poles are very intense for dogs that they run through them. <laughs> So you've got a thinking dog. You have dogs that are really having to pay attention. And I would love to, there's, there is definitely like um, a metaphor here, right? For life is like a series of jumping through. I haven't I figured it out yet, but I'm mean, going to have to come up with one because there is something uh, the same about life as in agility. I just don't know what it is. Um, and here's my puppy, the next agility dog. That's Lil. Isn't she adorable? Both these dogs, by the way, were um, uh, born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I picked them both up from here. So I do know that you're this area quite well. Uh, and this is the Chattanooga puppy's first experience of snow. <laughs> so he was like, wow, this is so tasty. <laughs> anyway, so that's the crazy part of me. And I appreciate your uh, attention. I hope I didn't talk too long. And I'm more than willing to take questions if you have any. Anybody? That's good or really bad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had one of those rods that was broken down? Did anybody? Any of those rods? Uh, um, well, it, they're mostly ball chain that I use, and it hasn't broken today. Well, it's not going to be um, But if it did, I mean, I have the maps that could be reassembled. It's pretty, steep, <coughs> you know, it's, it's you know, industrial stainless steel ball chain. And the Puerto Rico thing, that was stainless steel, so they wouldn't, I mean, they could fall, but they wouldn't break. It was bad. Oh, anybody else? Yeah. Well, you know, all the pieces, with the exception of one um, that I just didn't like the way it looked in its abstraction, and I did end up taking it apart, and it was a big one, it was 10,000 spools. It took as long to take apart as it did to make. Uh, but no, they stay together, because you, when I took that piece apart, I thought, oh, I would be able to use this for other pieces, but it just didn't seem to be the same colors. You'd think there'd be more overlap, um, so you know, I ended up with a lot of extra spools. Yeah, that's why I try to be really careful up front. And, but sometimes you're in a rush and you have a deadline and you end up doing something you're not sure about and then you end up with a not your best piece and then you own it. It's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do, uh, do you have a contract with Cooks and Parks? Can I read them or they make the colors for you? Um, uh, they don't need to. They come in 302 colors. So that's So you just pick the colors from their inventory? There are like five shades of white, but unless you looked at them side by side, you'd think they were all white. But here's the crazy part, but I'm trying to pick like, okay, I'm trying to go, okay, I only need four of these, I'm sure. And I'm like, which one do I want to get rid of? Well, that one's kind of cool, because it's got a little blue. Oh, that one, I, well, it's got a little green, I got, and I'll end up with all five, because I have to have them all, even though they look the same. <laughs> so it's crazy, yeah, yeah. Um, you work a lot visually, obviously. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that you were talking a lot about technology as it's been used in the past mm -hmm. in art. Uh, do you truly feel that digital, the advent of digital technology is um, just the same significance as past uh, new technology like the camera on, era? On art? Yeah, because it, as, it seems to be something different because it allows perfect uh, replication. Yeah, well, you know, the, the camera is you know, Optics turned into, you know, camera obscura optics and then camera, so it's still having a huge influence. But somebody told me that the digital art movement, like 10 years ago, is already the longest art movement in the history of art movements. 
and that surprised me. Um, I think it's, it, I mean, you'll be able to see it better when we look back 40 years, but right now it's still, you know, the works aren't, we're not seeing the, maybe we are beginning to look at the early ones going, <laughs> you know, how like juvenile. Um, it's the way you look at, you know, when, like even looking at when they started perspective, you can see the proto Renaissance, how off they were before somebody said, you need to do one point. And then all of a sudden it snaps to what we all agree is perspective, not that it is, but um, so I, but you can't see it until you move beyond it. So I do think it's, it's hugely significant. I mean, my work is based on it, that the, I couldn't do this work. I, well, I kind of could, but it'd be different. Is it, I mean, just one example of how the computer is doing something I couldn't do is it looks at nine pixels and then it overlaps nine pixels in all those directions and it does something called dithering. So the reason that you can get so much resolution out of, or so much detail out of like the Mona Lisa is it's creating the illusion of many more colors that are actually in the spectrum of thread colors. Um, and, and your eye can't do that. Although I have to say Chuck Close comes pretty close to that with his cellular works, and he's not digitally inspired at all, but that he can take a cell and break it apart into this, you know, these hot dog shapes and all that, and yet from a distance it all snaps back to, in a way, he's dithering. He's saying, if I put blue next to red next to this, it's going to give the illusion of brown. So, but it's different, you know, the computer definitely, the first thread spool piece I did was without uh, this custom software program I have now, I literally looked at thread spools on the table and the blown up each pixel on the monitor and guessed. And it does have different quality. It looks more like um, the reflection on the lake looks a little bit more paint by numbers because I wasn't able to dither. To dither like a, like a bird. <laughs> <laughs> what part of the thread do you use? Well, Coates and Clark was the, the double duty cotton thread over a polyester core was their biggest that was a 302. Who has that? Oh, I, I thought it was somewhere down here. I thought it's your mouth move, though. <laughs> um, so it, now they've shifted. Um, they have a new spool. It's larger. It's now 100% polyester, so it has a different sheen. Totally different look to it to me. And so it's encouraging me to continue on in the pop imagery that I've been doing anyway. I can't imagine uh, doing like an uh, you know, art historical serious old master's work with these new pop-like schools that have different qualities.